Good morning, New Hope. Aloha pa'ole. It's so wonderful to have you here with us this morning on this live stream or on the replay. Thank you for making an investment in your relationship with God for your future and for future generations. Many people wander through life trying to make a difference, but many of us get lost in the daily grind, the false expectations, whether we put on ourselves or from others, rather than purposely living the life and assignment God has called us to. Many people are heading somewhere, but few of us are heading somewhere on purpose. And I have to give credit to Craig Rochelle, Amanda Grace, and Lance Walnow for their teachings that have influenced this message today. Many believers are wandering around in the wilderness, maybe not even realizing or thinking about that there is a promised land ahead of us for us to take hold of that God has for us. Maybe there's some of us that we don't even know how we can get there. And I want to encourage you that there is the good news because God has a plan for your life and he has a purpose and a role for you in his story. And the good news also is that the Israelites, it took them 40 years wandering in the wilderness before they got to the promised land. But you, my friend, you don't have to take 40 years. And when, and when they looked at it, um, it could have taken them much sooner, but they kept going around and around. But we don't have to go around and around, right? We can choose every day that we're gonna follow hard after God and just know that his grace is there for you and that his promises, his plans, he made them before you were even in your mother's womb. He placed these desires, these spiritual gifts, talented, talents in there to equip you for all that he had created you to be and do. You have a specific and unique blueprint unlike anybody else's one and these things are on purpose by God. God has also brought you through personal past experiences where you've gained wisdom, insight, and even strategies. It's for such a time as this that God has placed you here on earth to glorify him, to, ex to bring the kingdom of God here on earth through your unique design and purpose. In today's message, discovering your role in God's story, this will help you to number one, prayerfully discover God's purpose and role that you have, um, God's purpose for your life and your role in his story. Because many people are heading somewhere, but few of us are heading somewhere on purpose. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you so much that you loved us and you created us with a purpose. You didn't just create us and then wonder, hmm, what am I, what, what, why are they here? What, what is their purpose? But no, you had a purpose and a plan before we were even in our mother's womb. I ask that your Holy Spirit would enlighten us, that you would shine your light to reveal the truth that is already there. Um, and is just waiting to be revealed. So we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. And we all say, Amen. Proverbs 29, 18 says that where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. And in other translations, it says that where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no revelation or vision for relationship, there could possibly be divorce, right? Troubles in marriages, in families, right? Where there is no vision for health concerns. We may cast off restraint and eat whatever we want to eat. Maybe not exercise. Um, maybe just not use our body the way it was created to function, right? When there is no vision for our finances or resources, we can end up stressed out and in bondage in debt, right? When there is no vision for our spiritual life, we could probably operate in worldly systems rather than operating in kingdom systems. And we just, we're like, why isn't, why isn't, um, God showing up in our life? But, well, it's because we've lacked this vision in our life. We lacked vision and purpose in our life that we lost 
that um, and we cast off restraint, right? We didn't have that revelation from God and we cast off that restraint, right? How food can impact the way that we think and function, right? Oh, maybe I won't eat those bonbons or that candy bar, right? We cast off restraint when we don't have vision. Jesus understood his identity, and let's just take a snapshot of his identity, territory, and purpose. It says in Luke 2, 49, and this is in the New King James Version, that even as a child, Jesus said to his parents, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Right? He knew even as a child that he would be about his heavenly father's business and then in luke 19 10 niv the son of man came to seek and save that which was lost he came to seek those who were lost those who are in need of a physician he knew who he was called to and in john 10 18 niv version it says no one takes it from me my life he's referring to but i lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. And so he understood that his purpose was to lay his life down and he had a choice. He had a choice to lay it down. He didn't he didn't do it because he was forced to do it, but he chose to do it because out of his love for us. And then in John 18, 37b, he says, in fact, the reason I was born, the reason Jesus was born and came into this world is to testify to the truth. He came to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. So everything he did, right? Everything he did and said was to testify to the truth. He understood his territory in John 17, 6. I, hear, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, speaking to the Father. You gave them to me and they have obeyed your word. Again, he understood his territory. He knew who he was coming for. He was coming for you and me. He was coming to die for us. He was coming to testify the truth so that we could be set free. He was doing that for you and I. As we seek God for our purpose, there are three areas in our life that overlap to reveal God's vision in our lives. So the first area is our core values, values that drive you, things that keep you up at night, Things where you say, I am drawing the line right here. The second area is our past experiences, events, and people that have helped to shape who you are today. The third area is spiritual gifts. These are special and unique abilities that God has given you. So where you see the three circles overlap of these three areas, you will see that God's unique vision for you is right in that center. When you understand God's vision for your life, you have a sense of purpose beyond your own life. You can wake up realizing that you have something important to focus on today. You can wake up on a mission. <laughs> you can grasp God's vision for your life and have direction. Um, you can also have peace because you're not going to be confused, not knowing what to do, but you're going to be able to make decisions much quicker and with more clarity because you can say no to the things that you know you're not called to, right? And um, you can also have peace knowing that you are not here just to exist, but you're here to partner with God to bring heaven here on earth. And also through your unique expression, through your unique way that God expresses himself to you. Did you know that? He expresses himself differently to each one of us. And that's why um, it's so beautiful, right? We prophesy in part, we know in part, because we need each other. He shows parts of himself to us, but together as a whole, Christ will be revealed. And that's why it's so important, like Pastor Dave talked about last week, that we have unity that we are one new people 
And like any good story, because we're talking about God's story here, is that God is that main character the main character in the story and also our relationship with him. It's a main priority and it influences the subplots in the story that he is writing in our lives. And so some of those subplots are um, our relationships with others. Um, John 13, 34, you can look these up on your own if you want to later on. Um, our health is another subplot there, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, through 20. A third subplot is our calling, our work life, our role. And then number four, resources. Uh, resources are another subplot. So finances, skills, people, influence, um, our experiences that we have gained from the things that we have been through. And also the experiences that we've been through have also given us an authority to help free other people from if God has freed us. <clears throat> Um, as you connect with God, I believe that he will reveal more of himself to, um, of, and who you are. Excuse me. So I want you to finish this sentence. My life is worth nothing unless I. My life is worth nothing unless I. <laughs> My life is worth nothing unless I finish that sentence. Let's see what Paul says about this, how he finishes this sentence in Acts 20, 24. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. He said, my life is worth nothing unless I testify to the good news of Jesus Christ, right? And you can see that in his life. He was very passionate about it. And years ago, God has given Pastor David and myself a vision to have a thriving marriage, to have children, to become debt free, become a benefactor, helping others, helping to expand the kingdom of God, using our resources <clears throat> and living a life that would create space to partner with God, to bring love to people who have not experienced his love and to help them to take one step closer to God. Many people are heading somewhere, but few people end up somewhere on purpose. I believe with God's help, you will live a life he has created for you on purpose. Hebrews 2, 1 says we must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. So living a life on purpose is like this. For those of us have, that have been in a boat, like Uncle Chris, who has gone fishing, or um, you know, if you're out in the ocean on a boat, if you don't have vision and you're not paying attention, what can happen? The wind and the waves can cause us to drift and we can end, actually end up in an area where there's rocks or there's large waves that can capsize our boat or cause us to be shipwrecked, right? When we lack vision, that's what can happen. But when we are, vi when we have vision, when we understand what we're supposed to be doing and what we're called to do, we can know where we're supposed to be and we can also head in that direction instead of being tossed to and fro by the winds and the waves of the sea. So let's take a, um, Let's take a focus on past experiences for a moment here. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that in all things, and all meaning all, in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So from that scripture, we see that no matter what we have been through, God is in the business of turning things for good. He can use the most awful, heinous things that have happened in our life and turn them for good to glorify him, to free other people, to set the captives free, right? And so let's take a quick glance at the past experiences of David in the Bible. And I want you, as I share this, to see if you see a theme in his life, okay? so. The first thing is he was a shepherd. He fought a lion and a bear with his bear, a uh, lion and a bear with his bare hands and to protect the sheep that he was tending. A major, pair, uh, a major past experience was being anointed king 
of Israel. And the spirit of the Lord came upon him at that moment. And this was at a very young age. He was, he was probably a preteen at this time. And um, he also, it was interesting that during this time, when Samuel said, bring your sons to me, he was not included. He was not brought to Samuel uh, when, when the parents were asked to bring him. I don't know if later on he thought about it. Maybe he was oblivious, you know, I don't know. But I thought that was interesting. If he was aware of it, he could have questioned why didn't they call him? Could have caused him to feel rejected. Um, you know, the Bible doesn't say so. I'm just, I'm just wondering this. And I wonder how his family treated him after Samuel had anointed him king. Uh, David, he was a talented musician and a worshiper of God. And two years later, after this happened, King Saul had summoned David to the palace, which I thought that is also very interesting to the palace, which God will be calling him to as well. Right. So I don't know. Has he been to the palace before? Was this his first time? And in 1 Samuel 16, 18, um, and this is what the one of the officials said. Okay, so talking about David is, I know one of Jesse's sons from Bethlehem who can play well. He's a courageous man and a warrior, and he has a way with words. He's handsome, and the Lord is with him. And it's very interesting because when David would go there, you could see that there was an anointing and a grace that supernaturally would cause these tormenting spirits to leave Saul. So in 1 Samuel 17, um, three years after that, David ends up killing Goliath, the giant, right? The giant that defied God and the Israelites and it's interesting because David, he wasn't even um, supposed to be there, right? He wanted to be there. He wanted to be in the middle of the action and he ended up bringing the guys some food, right? Some lunch. And then he sees what's happening and something rises up in him, right? That Some passion, right? Some passion rises up with him and he's like, it, you ain't going to be doing this, no Goliath, right? So he, what does he end up doing? He ends up fighting Goliath. He ends up standing up to Goliath. Um, he, he uses what God has placed already in his hands. He doesn't use what the world is offering him. And God uses him to slay the giant. God uses this young man to slay a giant, this shepherd boy. And so after that, he wins many battles against the enemies of Israel. He wins many battles against the enemies of Israel. Ask Holy Spirit, if you're wondering, why are you repeating that? Ask Holy Spirit, why is she repeating that? He won many battles against the enemies of Israel, right? This shepherd boy. <laughs> and Saul ends up firing him from his court and making him a commander in his army and he becomes successful. King Saul offers his daughter in marriage to David and then in 1 Samuel 19 we see that King Saul becomes jealous of David because the people love him because what is he doing? He's defi he's um he is um overcoming, defeating their enemies. And he becomes famous and what happens is Saul ends up trying to kill David and David actually has several opportunities to kill King Saul but he doesn't because he knows that Saul is God's anointed one and he knows that if he did that it would be dishonoring to God and that's in 1 Samuel 24 chapters 24 to 28 um, it's definitely a low point in David's life you know to actually you know to have the most powerful person on earth right the king want to kill you not a high point at all right as far as his past experiences but even in that time of rejection while he fled from Saul what part of his identity can you see in this God brings and notice here God brings he doesn't look for the people that God has is calling him to but God brings him to David and those people are people in distress, in debt, and in discontent. And God uses them and to turn them into mighty warriors. And this is in 1 Samuel 22, 2. 
And all those who were in distress or in debt or discontented, they gathered around him and he became their commander. And you know how many people that was? That was 400 men that were there with him. When Saul dies, David is anointed king of Judah with the help of his allies. And still at this time though, there's a lot of things going on. The nation is still divided between Israel and Judah. There's a lot of divisiveness going on. And there's a civil war that rages on between these two kingdoms. But with the help of the Lord and his allies, David reigns over both Israel and Judah and unites them. And so um, I'm not going to go through everything, every single thing in David's life, but I just felt like the Lord wanted me to highlight these things. We can also see that David goes astray from God's plans. You know, I don't know if it's because of the power, right? Um, there is a mantle when you have a power and authority, right? It's so easy to abuse it. It's so easy to think I'm in control rather than forgetting that who is really in control is God, right? And we see that, um, you know, as David being king, he goes astray from God's plans and he takes on more wives. Um, 2 Samuel 11 and 12, chapters 11 and 12. And while David is not walking in his identity and assignment, um, he doesn't fight the battles with his men and he ends up um, committing adultery with Bathsheba and also murdering her husband Uriah. So what happens is God loves David so much that he sends Nathan the prophet to David. And in 2 Samuel 12, um, Nathan shows up at David's door and it's interesting. Notice what story Nathan tells David. He uses a story about a rich man and a poor man, and the rich man ends up stealing the poor man's female baby sheep. Female baby sheep to who once was the shepherd boy. And um, there's a traveler coming to the rich man's house, and instead of him slaughtering one of his animals, he takes the poor man's female baby sheep that he even considers like his own child. He takes it from him and he kills that poor man's sheep. Well, what ha what is David's reaction? Oh my gosh, his passion, his anger. What does he get angry about? The sheep. Oh my gosh, how could someone do that to the sheep? That man should be killed. That man should be punished. Nathan's response to David is, you are that man. Whoa, right? And so it's interesting an interesting theme, right, that he uses in his life. And um, can you see a theme there? Um, David is unique that he had priestly and kingly qualities, which that is also very unique because most of the times, you know, they're just kings. They weren't, they weren't really priestly, kingly uh, people, right? And um, where's my notes here? He, you know, but you see that in his life that he danced before the ark of the Lord in 2 Samuel 6, 14. It was um, also very rare, but he instituted Levitical and prophetic times of worship. He wanted it to be elaborate and the presence of God would manifest in very powerful ways. And so um, the glory cloud would fill the room, right? And God took him from caring for the sheep to caring for the people of Israel, 2 Samuel 7. You can see his identity to protect God's people and raising them to be warriors in many of these past experiences, both good experiences and the bad experiences. David led with skillful hands and a pure heart. David didn't have to try to be a shepherd. It was in his wiring. It was there all along. He cared for the sheep as a young boy in, uh, in all of their stinkiness, right? In all of its unpleasant trees, I guess you could say. Um, and he cared for God's people while he was king. He would risk his life with the lion and the bear. He would also risk his life with Goliath and he would also win battles over the enemies of God's people. And he would also unite them. And so I want you, now that we looked at David and it kind of gives you an idea, I want you with the Lord to examine your past experiences and create a, time lap, a timeline of your past experiences. 
So as we go over this, I want you to see how God uses your past experiences, both bad and good, high or low, for to prepare you for your future. And what I want you to do, and if you don't have this, please don't feel like you have to go out and buy it or anything, but I want you to grab a yellow, pink, blue, and green. Sorry, I couldn't find the green um, post-it uh, sticky notes um, and a pen you know could be a sharpie pen or just a ballpoint pen and I want you to recall uh, so step number one is recall the events and people that God has used to shape you both good and bad and painful experiences take as much time that you need and write them down on yellow post-it notes okay so what is the first post-it note you're going to use it's the yellow post-it notes okay um, you can go back to this um, video and pause it if you want the replay and pause it uh, to go over the steps um, and then then step number two is I want you to scan through those yellow post-it notes and identify those painful past experiences and transfer those pa painful past experiences to a pink post-it note. Okay, so those painful past experiences. Um, and it's only those painful past experiences that have significantly impacted your life. Okay, so not like, I fell on the ground and I skinned my knee. You don't have to put that, okay? <laughs> uh, and then step number three, right? So if you're watching the replay, you can pause it here. But step number three, you, I want you to look over your notes and try to identify things that are related, okay? And what you're going to do is you're going to separate them into three to six God story chapters and move those, you can move those sticky notes around and, and with the blue sticky post-it notes, I want you to write chapter one, chapter two, and so forth, but no more than six chapters, okay? And then you can pause it here and do that for the replay. And then step number four is I want you to look over each of the chapters and what is, what are the major life lessons that you've learned during such a particular chapter in your life. And I want you to try to come up with one lesson per chapter. It doesn't have to come from a life event or person in that chapter, but maybe you look through it and you're like, I, I God was, you know, really showing me or what I really learned through this chapter was this. Then I want you to take your green, sorry, pretend this is green, your green sticky note, and I want you to write that life lesson down and place that green sticky note underneath the chapter. So thank you for sticking with me on the last step, step number five. I want you to ask the Lord to reveal his purpose for you or a theme that's going on um, from your past experiences. And I know it's a lot to process and this will might evolve over time that the Holy Spirit might reveal more things to you as you ponder this. In closing, in closing, if you didn't hear anything else that I talked about, I want you to hear this, that you have a role in God's story and it was God's idea. It wasn't our idea. So he had the idea. He will bring it to fruition. And I want to encourage you, don't settle for anything less because you play a vital role in God's story. Did you know how, how would people be impacted if there was no Mother Teresa? How would people have been impacted if there was no Billy Graham? How would people have been impacted? impacted if past leaders in your life said no to the call of God in their lives, right? You were impacted because someone said yes to the purposes of God in their life. And by you saying yes to God, to the role that you have and the purpose he has in your life, you will impact people. You are probably already impacting people. You are so powerful in God's story. And so I want to encourage you, receive the vision God has for your life. Don't settle for anything less. 
Last month, we just celebrated Christmas and we've all seen that movie, A Wonderful Life. And we could see how George's life impacted his town. And the same for you in your sphere of influence, whether it's at your, in your family, your workplace, your school, your community, our city, our state, right? You have a role to play. And even in our nation, in, in for such time as this now is a time God is calling us to come into alignment to rise up into our identities in the callings that he has for us and just like in a symphony we all have a role to play right and so if there was no percussion section if there was no trumpet section there would be something missing you are a vital part you are a vital part of God's story and so let us pray. Yes, so thank you, God. We thank you, Lord, that my sisters and brothers here, they have a vital role to play in your story. And I pray, God, that as they spend time with you, um, just recalling the things of the past and the things that you have brought them through, would you highlight with your Holy Spirit a theme that's happening, the breadcrumbs that have already been scattered through their past, through their identity, their wiring that's coming through, their identity that is coming through. Would you highlight those things with your Holy Spirit, with your light, shine your light in those hidden places, connect those dots. And I just see, I see dots connecting. I see light bulbs going off. So I thank you, Lord, that you are re revealing things to your people. Things that were hidden are coming into the light, coming into alignment. And I just want to also share with you, if it's your first time coming and joining us, we're glad that you're here. And it's by no mistake that you've, you've stumbled across us because God wants you to know that you have a vital role in God's story. And maybe you've never invited the Lord into your life. Maybe you've never surrendered your life to him. And you're saying, I want to be a part of God's story. Well, today's that day that you can do that. And all you need to do is invite him into your life, surrender your life to him and say, yes, I want to be a part of your story, God. And we're, I'm just going to pray for you right now and just hitchhike along with my prayer. Thank you, God, for what you've done. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for my sins and to give me life in you to have this relationship with you that I don't have to feel ashamed that I don't have to carry this guilt because you took all that punishment on yourself so I thank you for forgiving me of my sins falling short my past mistakes my past mis failures God that they're all forgiven that I've been set free from that that I have this new start in you to be a part of God's story and so I surrender my life to you and I yield um, myself to you, God, to um, embrace the role that I play in your story. In Jesus' name, and we all say, amen. God bless you, church.